Would you turn with me, please, to John chapter 19? John chapter 19. I'm stepping away from 1 Corinthians or, or as we preach through the book of 1 Corinthians to take today to preach on a, on a, on a specific topic. Uh, if you recall, when we were going through the book of Acts, uh, in chapters 25 and 26, that's when Paul gives his defense before the Roman governor Festus and the Jewish king Agrippa. Agrippa was the son of Herod. He's the one who killed James. He's the one who imprisoned Peter. He was the last of the Herod, Herods who play a significant role in New Testament history. His great uncle, Herod Antipas, was the Herod of the Gospels. His great-grandfather, Herod the Great, he ruled at the time when Jesus was, abor was born. Agrippa was most likely of Jewish ancestry. He was raised in the midst of Jewish life, making him well-versed in Jewish affairs. Paul knew this, and, and near the close of his defense, he puts Agrippa on the spot. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now, to say yes, it would mean that he would have to admit that what, what they taught about Jesus' death and resurrection was true, which would make him appear foolish before Governor Festus. To deny the prophets, well, that would outrage his Jewish subjects. And so instead of answering, Agrippa seeks to dismiss Paul with a question of his own. In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Now this phrase, in a short time, it's a little obscure. Agrippa is either saying, Paul, do you think you can convince me to become a Christian in such a short time? Or, Paul, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. You know, either way, the implication is that Paul's arguments were compelling. They were having an impact upon Agrippa. The only problem was Agrippa was unwilling to take any sort of public stand on the matter. Inwardly, he may have held the conviction that Paul was speaking the truth. He couldn't deny what, Jesus, or what Paul was saying. He, he might have been moved by Paul's words. Inwardly, there was the awareness, perhaps even the desire, to know, to understand more but Agrippa could go no further. He could see where he would like to go, but he didn't have the courage to act. He felt compelled, but, but did, not, did not have the will to move. He wasn't far from the kingdom of God, but he, he halted outside the gate. He neither condemned nor ridiculed Christianity, but like a man paralyzed, he could only look at it, examine it. He didn't have the strength of heart to, to reach out, lay hold of it himself, and receive it to himself. And sadly, there are many in churches today like Agrippa. They believe the Bible. They have no great objections to the gospel. They admire men who are, who are committed, who are outspoken followers of Christ. They, they come regularly. They even give their money. But sadly, they never seem to get beyond a certain point in their Christianity. They never come out boldly on Christ's side. They never take up their cross. They, they never confess Christ before men, and they never give up the inconsistencies in their life. So when you speak to these folks, they always mean, intend, plan, desire to someday be a more committed Christian. They know that they're not what they should be. They hope to one day be different. That day, though, it, it never seems to come. They remain well-meaning every day until they run out of day. They're kind. They're good-natured. They're helpful. They're respectable people. They're not enemies. 
to friends. Like Agrippa, they're either content to be almost Christians. They're content to be just outside the door. You just simply won't get them to go any further. There's another possibility too, though. They may be Christians, only they're secret ones. There is simply little outward evidence to the little faith that's in their heart. Can you see what the problem is here? From the standpoint of salvation, the almost Christian and the secret Christian are worlds apart. But practically speaking, the differences can be negligible. You know, let's say a person has great interest in art. And so they decide that they're going to visit the Louvre in Paris. They save up their money for a trip. They, they take their time off of work. They endure that long transatlantic flight to Paris. You know, if this person was like Agrippa, when they got to the Louvre, they would find a nice park bench outside and they'd have a seat. They almost went to the Louvre. But if the person was a secret follower of Christ when they visited the Louvre, they'd pay the admission, they'd enter through the front doors, and they'd find a nice bench in the lobby and they'd have a seat there. Only one of those people can say that they actually went in the museum, but neither of them enjoyed it as they could have. See, when it comes to Christ and salvation, the implications between those two kinds of people are, are far greater than just enjoyment. The difference is heaven and hell. But enjoyment is a factor too. Right? When, you, when you taste good food, when you taste really good food, you know, one bite is not enough. Right? You want more. God invites us to taste and see that he is good. And the more that we taste of him, the more good we experience. There's far too many Christians, though, who keep themselves from experiencing more of God's goodness. They, they fear what men will think of them if they appear too zealous for Jesus. They fear the consequences of being known as a Christian. They might be ridiculed. They might be excluded. They might be passed by. Or they might be seen as hypocrites. So secret followers of Christ get little assurance of their salvation and lingering regrets of their fear. And this morning we're going to look at two secret disciples who decide to finally step forward and be publicly identified with Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And given the opportunity, what advice would they give to other secret disciples? Overall, I think that they would say this, that following Christ secretly is foolish, for it brings little assurance and lingering regret. Following Christ secretly is foolish, for it brings little assurance and lingering regret. Specifically, here are five bits of advice I'm suggesting that they would, they would give to all secret disciples. Advice that is designed to urge us not to waste our opportunity and become vital, effective witnesses for Christ. Find Jesus while you can. Fix the cross in your mind. Fear God more than man and focus on what God says. So I'd like to read our text here, which is in John chapter 19. beginning in verse 38, beginning immediately after the crucifixion of Jesus. Would you read with me and then we'll pray. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes 
about 100 pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Would you pray with me? Father, you have sent your Son into the world so that those who were, chil- were objects of your wrath might be rescued. It was through Christ identifying himself with us sinners that we could be made holy ourselves and escape your wrath. And so we, as those rescued, may we be willing to identify ourselves with your Son, for he is worthy. He is the Lord. He is the sovereign King. He is exalted above all else. He has all rule and all authority. There is none like him. There is no one above him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so may you cause anyone here with little faith, secret disciples, to come out into the open. And if there are any almost Christians here, Lord, may you draw them to bow their knee openly publicly and confess Christ as Lord. Do this work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 38, John, he suddenly introduces us to Joseph, who is from Arimathea. And then in the next verse, John brings back someone that he introduced back in chapter 3, which is Nicodemus. Um, He came uh, to a clandestine meeting with Jesus. Um, We don't know a whole lot about these two men, but what we do know is significant. They were each rich. They were prominent men. Both were members of the Sanhedrin. They believed in Jesus, at least to some degree. Nicodemus had confessed at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he was at least a teacher from God. And on that occasion, though, Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night, a fact that John reiterates each time he refers to him, including in our text today. Joseph of Arimathea is described here and in Matthew as a disciple, prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, Luke says that he was a good and righteous man. He uh, Luke also informs us that Joseph had not consented to their plan and action to condemn Jesus, and yet apparently his protests were silent ones. In both cases, we're left wondering about whether or not these men were truly born-again followers of Christ. Just as there's little evidence up to this point of their conversion, there was certainly little assurance For them, they must have wondered if they were truly following him as well as they silently stood by and allowed Jesus to unjustly be condemned. Having disagreed with it in their hearts and not with their voices, it must have produced a considerable amount of regret within them. There's no mystery as to what Joseph and Nicodemus that kept them from confessing Jesus. John tells us, tells us in verse 38, it was fear. Fear of the Jews, specifically. Apparently, these were not the only ones among the rulers who had had believed in Jesus, yet had failed to confess him openly. If we were to go back to chapter 12, verse 42, it says, Many, even of the rulers, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, in their defense, we, we do have the Apostle Peter, right? Peter was an outspoken follower of Christ. He was a leader of the disciples, and along with James and John, he, it was, uh, he was one of the three closest to Jesus. So we have, no a trouble, we have no trouble affirming Peter's salvation. And yet three times, in one night, 
he outright denied any relationship with Jesus. In one devastating evening, he exchanged his assurance and his joy for overwhelming fear and devastating regret. So what do we learn from the examples of Joseph, Nicodemus, and Peter? We learn the truth of what Jesus said in John 15, verse 5. You know the verse, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, regardless of what we think we are, Christ is the believer's source of strength and courage. A bold Christian can blow it miserably when he depends on himself and not upon Christ. A secret Christian will soar gloriously when he looks to Christ and not himself. So what would these men say to us today? They were prominent, influential, rich men who believed in Jesus, yet for a season they valued the approval of men more than the approval of God. And from the standpoint of Scripture, this is their last stand right here. We're we're not going to read any more about them in the rest of the Bible having lived their lives as they did, making the choices they made, what advice would they give us? Well, specifically, what would they say to someone who is living as they lived, as a secret disciple of Christ? Well, the first advice they might give is find Jesus while you can. Find Jesus while you can. Why would some former secret disciples tell another secret disciple to find Jesus? Well, very simple. A secret disciple is just that, secret. You don't know if a secret disciple is truly saved or not. There's very little to no visible fruit of a changed life. And therefore, there's little assurance of salvation. Good reason for doubt. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? He sounds like someone we might find in any decent church in America. He was was wealthy. He, He sought to live an upright moral life, keeping God's commandments from his youth. Ultimately, though, what did he do? He walked away from Jesus. He loved the trinkets of this world more than the favor of God. A secret disciple might comfort themselves saying, uh, well, I'll never walk away from Jesus. That's really a moot point because it's not even evident whether you're walking with Jesus in the first place. A secret disciple needs to be certain that he or she has truly found Jesus. You know, we'd all do well to remember the episode in, in Luke chapter 13 where we find Jesus teaching amongst the cities and the villages. And along the way, a man asked the Lord Jesus a very important question. He said, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? You know, we don't know who he was. We don't know why he asked his question. But one thing is very clear, and that's the answer that the Lord gave. Jesus seized the opportunity to direct the minds of all those who are around him to that which is their plain duty. Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Strive, Jesus said. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Whether there will be a few saved or many You know what? Your priority is clear. Strive to enter through the narrow door. There is one door, and it must be entered. A day is coming when, when many will seek to enter in, and they will not be able, Jesus says. Therefore, strive to enter now. You know, it's enough for you to say, I. Is it enough for you to say, I. I think I've entered the door. 
You know, that, that single word that Jesus uses, strive, it teaches us so much. Strive teaches us that God has provided the way. Any man who wants to be saved must strive, must diligently use the means that God has provided. Effort is required on our part. We must strive to enter, Jesus says. Sitting still, doing nothing, it gets you nowhere with God. Strive also teaches us that all men are responsible for choosing to come to Christ, and God will hold us accountable for our decision. The Lord Jesus doesn't tell us wait. He doesn't tell us wish. He doesn't tell you feel or hope or desire. He tells you strive. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus' words tell us that we must respond. He says, come, repent, believe, work, ask, seek, knock. Right, My friends, the Bible is clear that our salvation from first to last is entirely of God. He is sovereign over our salvation. However, the Bible is equally clear that any man who ends up lost is responsible for his own destruction. The sinner is always addressed in the Bible as accountable, as responsible, and there is now no better proof of this than is found in this word, strive. Next, strive teaches us that all who desire to be saved should expect many adversaries. They should expect a hard battle. The phrase, no pain, no gain, it's just as true in spiritual matters as it is in the physical. There is a, a roaring lion, the devil, who never lets a soul escape without a struggle. Our hearts are naturally resistant to God. They're inclined towards sin and the things of this world. And then there's the world itself with all its oppositions, all its temptations. See, none of these things will be overcome without much conflict. But should this surprise us? Right? What things are worth pursuing that come easily? Ground, it needs to be plowed. Money needs to be earned with sweat and with care and ingenuity. Success is achieved with long hours, hard work. How much more so heaven? Right? It cannot be reached without the cross and without spiritual battle. A man must strive. Strive also teaches us that, that if there is anything that deserves a struggle in this world, isn't it the well-being of your soul? Most objects that men and women are striving for, they're worthless. They are vain by comparison. Wealth, greatness, prestige, education, all these things certainly have their value. But every one of them will come to an end. Christ offers you his peace, which surpasses understanding, a solid hope for a blessed future, the true sense of God's presence in us, the consciousness that we are forgiven, safe, prepared, provided for both today, for all eternity, whatever may happen. Wealth may disappear. Status among men, it can fall. My possessions may burn up. My knowledge may be insufficient, but Christ will never leave you or forsake you. That, my friends, is true and lasting riches. Secret Christian, this is something that you must strive to have. And you Are you certain that you are striving? In addition to all of this, strive teaches us one last important lesson. If Christ's plea was to strive to enter through the narrow door, all who are outside it are in great danger. They're in danger of being lost forever. There's but a step between them and death. If death should come upon them in this condition, they're lost forever. You will never hear Jesus telling people, you know, take your time. Take your time regarding salvation. His urging is not to wait another moment. He speaks as one who saw the daily danger approaching and he cries out, strive to enter now. Don't delay. 
You know, all around us, people are striving. They're striving to be rich. They're striving to be happy in this world. Great effort is made about money, about business, about success, about politics. Great strides are made in science, in the arts, in vacations, amusements, right? People work day in, day out to pay rent, earn a salary, have money for food, other necessities. See, such striving is in great abundance everywhere. How few people, though, are concerned about their souls. How few are striving to enter into this narrow door. How tragic it would be that you would perish forever because you would not strive. You think it takes some great sin to make you worthy of hell? You have only to sit still and do nothing and you will find yourself there in the end. The road to hell is not filled only with murderers and rapists and pedophiles and thieves. There are far more on that road who are spiritually lazy and willfully ignorant. And many of those on the road are members of churches, consider themselves upright citizens. They fit the description of someone attempting to follow Christ secretly. You know, perhaps you're thinking, hey, I'm striving. I go to church. I read my Bible sometimes. I, I, I pray when I have a need. You know, what gives? Well, let me urge you, secret Christian, not to suppose that you can strive too much. You can never do too much for yourself spiritually. Right? In all labor, there is profit, the Proverbs say. In fact, there is no labor so profitable as that which is for your soul. Therefore, Christian, guard yourself against even the slightest carelessness about spiritual graces. Beware of prayerlessness. Guard against failing to read the Word. Be watchful of a lazy attitude about church and fellowship. Fight against sleepy, critical, or complaining as you listen to the preaching of God's Word. You can afford to be moderate in other areas of your life. You can be careful not to go to certain extremes, but when it comes to God, though, pursue Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Fear moderation when it comes to your soul as you would fear the AIDS virus. Stop caring what others think of you. Let it be enough that your Lord tells you to strive. This door is narrow, Jesus says. It's narrow to all who would love their sin more than Christ. It's narrow to all who love this world and seek first its pleasures and rewards. It's narrow to all who come more, care more about the opinion of men than of God. And this will never change. And there's coming a day when this door, this narrow door, it's going to be barred shut. This is the time when Jesus speaks of where many will seek to enter and will not be able. Many will try at that time. They'll seek after God, but it will be useless. Many will try at that time to enter, but they'll not be able. Right? They'll discover their mistake one day, but unless there is repentance today, it will be too late. At that time, no one will be able to deny that there is a God that there's a devil, that there's a heaven, that there's a hell, all will see with their own eyes. Faith and belief will finally become one. But it will be too late. All that was scornful and worthless about Christianity, it will at that time be, be proven true and necessary. On that day, all will long to be saved. All will long to be forgiven. All will long for peace. They'll long for God's grace, but such faith and such desires, they'll come too late. I have no doubt that this is where Joseph and Nicodemus would start with us. Strive to enter the narrow door. Secret Christian, make certain that you have found Jesus before it's too late. Now, the next bit of advice that they would give to the secret disciple, fix the cross in your mind. Fix the cross in your mind. See, up until Jesus was crucified, 
Joseph and Nicodemus were content to say nothing. They remained silent while Jesus was unjustly condemned and killed. And then after he was dead, Joseph provided a tomb and Nicodemus some extravagant burial spices. See, so often we fail to realize what we have until it's gone. We give flowers at funerals when we hardly said an encouraging word to the deceased while they were alive. Such things are preventable. And then out of nowhere, Joseph steps out. It says in verse 38 that Joseph asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. So we need to understand some things so we can truly appreciate really what the Bible tells us Joseph has done here. We know that Rome made an exception in the case of the Jews in allowing the bodies of of crucified criminals to be taken down. They would normally be left up for, for the vultures. The Jews never refused to bury any executed criminal, but instead of allowing the bodies of such sinners to be placed in family tombs where they might desecrate those already buried, they provided a burial site for criminals just outside the city. And this was the... This was where the other two men uh, crucified alongside Jesus were most likely buried. Joseph, however, he used his rank as a member of the Sanhedrin to gain access to Pilate, ask for the body of Jesus. So we take note of what Jesus, or excuse me, Joseph did for two reasons. First, Joseph knew he was making enemies from amongst his peers in doing this. Secondly, Joseph was asking for preferential treatment from Pilate for a man executed for sedition. See, Joseph didn't know the nature of the exchange between Jesus and Pilate. We can read about it. Joseph had no idea. He didn't know that Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. See, this is showing us the courage that it took for Joseph to step out and do this. The fact that Pilate granted Joseph's request, more than anything else, probably reflects Pilate's conviction that that Jesus was not guilty. Along with Joseph, Nicodemus also stepped forward into the light. John says that he brought with him in verse 39 a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. This is a significant amount of spices. By way of comparison, when Gamaliel, the elder, who was a very respected man by the people of Israel, when he died in 50 AD, about 80 pounds of spices were burned in his honor. John's mention of the weight is to show the great honor that this wealthy man was showing Jesus in his death. Most likely this was a combined effort on their part with Joseph taking care of the legal matters to get his body and Nicodemus securing the spices. What can explain the change in Joseph and Nicodemus from secret disciples to bold disciples? They'd been delaying their response to Christ. Right? They, they thought that they could put it off. They thought that they could delay their confessing him as their Lord, put off following him indefinitely. But providence intervened. And here is Christ at the end of his life. They're, they're confronted with him. Right? What brought about such change? The great change that took place was the cross. See, when Joseph and Nicodemus came unhappily with the Sanhedrin and stood watching Jesus die, these two men were changed. When the centurion stood apart from the mob, apart from the gambling men, watched Jesus die, the centurion was changed. The cross changes people. Once our Savior said that if he were lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. And here we see all kinds of men being 
drawn to him, Jews and Gentiles both, saying things aloud, doing revolutionary things before the whole world. Jesus' grace and suffering is a means of grace to us, right? His forgiving love on the cross, it makes us more loving. <clears throat> His courage makes secret disciples courageous. His concern for a dying crook, it makes us concerned for others. His assurance that that, that day that criminal would be with him in paradise, it makes us long to trust him too. Be with him the moment that we die. Jesus' words of confidence that the work he did was finished, it makes us zealous to declare the glorious, finished work of Christ. See, secret disciples won't remain secret for long if they will fix the cross in their minds. The cross demands a response from you. It faces you with your sin and with the lover of your soul. It overwhelms you with grace because it reminds you again and again that the cross was how God in his wisdom decided to save his people. <clears throat> he could have done it any way he chose. No one could have questioned his justice. No one could have challenged him. The cross was what we deserved, not what he deserved. The cross reminds us that Jesus willingly became a curse for us. And that the Father, precisely because he did not spare his own Son, poured out his richest blessings upon you. What love. That God judged his sinless Son without sparing him. And God pardoned sinful rebels, sparing them. What love offered to you. That though he knew all about your double dealings, he offers you mercy for Jesus' sake. The cross is where the scarlet stain of your sin is wiped away and you are made white as snow. See, Joseph and Nicodemus, they would tell you to fix your mind on that cross. The cross where Christ died. The cross is where God demonstrates his unashamed love for sinners like you and me through his death. And if you do that, the cross will change you like it did them. Another important bit of advice that they would give is to fear God more than man. Fear God more than man. John says the reason Joseph was a secret disciple was for fear of the Jews. Now normally this would condemn him in John's eyes. But Joseph redeemed himself by his courage to take action in asking for the body of Jesus. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 25. Turn there. Just keep your finger here and turn to Proverbs 29, 25. <clears throat> I want you to quietly read these verses as I say them. I, just, I want them to come out of your mouth. Verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Say it under your breath with me. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. What's a snare? A snare is a trap. That's what it is. No matter who you become, no matter what your accomplishments in this life, you are always vulnerable to, being, to be ensnared, trapped by fearing man's rejection or ridicule. There will always be someone's good opinion that matters to you. Nicodemus was already recognized as a great teacher in Israel, and yet that honor didn't override the deterring thought of what others might think or do, so he visited Jesus under cover of darkness. How many people would confess Christ, but because they desire praise or acceptance, they, they nevertheless fail to confess him because they think someone might despise them or scorn them or think less of them in some way? How unnecessary. 
how dangerous this is. It's unnecessary because there is no danger in ridicule. It may not feel good. We may naturally prefer a different treatment from our peers, but there is no danger in ridicule. In fact, the opposite is true. When we take a stand for Christ and righteousness, then we are most secure. It's when we are silent that we are most in danger. Not only in this life, but regarding the life that is to come, there's little assurance for the secret disciple. If you're holding back from an outright confession of Christ and a determination to stand with Him, whatever may come, if you're holding back from that, you're probably rationalizing your failure like this. You know, what, what good will my testimony do? What matters is that I'm a child of God, and I can be that in silence. Can you? Can you really be confident that you are truly a born-again believer and disciple of Christ if you will not confess Christ openly? You know what the Scriptures say. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. See, why would we ever be so foolish as to fear man more than God? Our fear of man is irrational. It's the epitome of foolishness. We really have no idea just how vulnerable we are to this fear. The fear of man, it has ensnared some of the greatest of believers. Remember Abraham? What do we call him? The father of faith. He once nobly stood before the king of Sodom and said, I will not take a thread or a sandal thong of anything that's yours. That was a king. But how small he looked before Abimelech, another king, when in his fear he lied, calling Sarah his wife and not his sister. Or the other way, his sister and not his wife. Don't forget about Elijah, one of the greatest of all men. He took on all the prophets of Baal, had them all killed by the brook of Kishon. He goes to the top of Mount Carmel. He prays until a three-year drought ends. And yet after this great excitement, he's afraid of one woman, Jezebel. And the great Elijah, he shrinks down into a frightened man. He runs away and he cries, It's enough now, O Lord. Take my life. You see, the fear of man is a snare. It's a snare that will take down the greatest of men and throw them in the dust. What little assurance is available for those who fail to confess Christ openly and stand with him, even in the face of ridicule and persecution. So what are we to do? You know, I imagine Joseph and Nicodemus offering us this last bit of advice. Focus on what God says. Focus on what God says. Jesus put it very plainly in Matthew 10, verse 28. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What is fear but a lack of faith? It's failing to recall to mind the truth about who God is and allowing the momentary, transitory, limited and ultimately inconsequential authority of man to eclipse the majestic, eternal, sovereign reign of God. 
Did you know that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun? And yet when the conditions are just right, it can totally eclipse the, totally eclipse the sun from view. That's why it's our duty to always be on our guard. We must be watchful. For the evil one is out there and he's setting his snares. And the best way to prepare ourselves is to humbly depend on God every day in his word and in prayer. These are the spiritual disciplines. If you forsake them, you're putting yourself at risk. Neglect in the private devotions to God will lead to public neglect and failure. It's inevitable. I was just telling someone the other day, you know, I've, I've heard people make much of when Jesus comes and finds the disciples sleeping in the garden and he says, watch and pray. And I thought, he's just, he's just rebuking them for falling asleep. But how true that is of us in this life. We need to watch and pray and not fall asleep. It's all too easy. Would you look with me at Isaiah 51? Verse 7. Isaiah 51, verse 7. It begins this way. Listen to me. Okay, are you listening? God wants you to listen. Are you listening? Listen to me, you who know righteousness. A people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their reviling. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever and my salvation to all generations. Is there a Joseph here? A Nicodemus? Have you had enough of little assurance and lingering regret? It's time to step forward into the light. You're not following some humiliated Jewish preacher. You are following the Lord of glory. He doesn't ask you to be a witness for him. He demands it. He alone is worthy. He can demand this. It's foolish to follow Christ secretly because it brings little assurance and lingering regret. Turn away from your sinful, Christ-dishonoring fear. Be a light for Him to those who are around you. Or maybe you're more like Agrippa. You're an almost Christian. There's many wonderful promises that God makes in His Word to those who would choose to follow Him. But keep in mind, though, that the Bible also makes promises to those who never come to him. To those who promised that they'd come one day but never did. To those who told themselves they'd come after this accomplishment or that achievement or this phase of life but were cut short. To those who didn't come because they were angry at God for not giving them what they wanted or taking something away they loved to those who thought they'd settle down one day and get religious. God promises you one thing, an eternity of regret. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How are you not obeying? He says, come, come to me. So staying as you are today, it will only lead to regret. Turn away from your sin. Come openly and follow the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So will you do that? Will you come? The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, 
come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Come. Let's pray. I want your words to linger. Come. I remember, Lord, when I stood there with the line, so to speak, in front of me. And I thought of all the reasons why I I shouldn't come. And in the circumstances that you had me in and the way you'd made me and wired me, there was one appeal that I could not silence. And that was hell. I, I knew there was a hell as much as I knew there was a God. And I knew that apart from, from, from me figuring out how to get to heaven, I was going to head to hell. And on that day, so many years ago, I dropped my weapons and I came. I stopped running and I came. And I have never looked back. I have never wished I didn't come to you. You have filled me with joy, peace, assurance. You have satisfied me. You have dealt kindly with me. You have chastened and disciplined me as any loving father would. But I have never looked back and regretted that I came. Move upon hearts even today. They need to strive to enter. They've sat there doing nothing. They've acted as Joseph and Nicodemus once did, secret. And in their secrecy, they were uncertain. So let them come forward and claim you. Please do your work for their sakes and for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.